Our final speaker today will be Alex Schulte, presenting on the anti Vanderworm number of graphs. All right, thanks for coming. And uh, this is joint work with Michael Young, who is my advisor, uh, Nathan Wormberg, and Hunter Rent. Hunter is an uh, he was an undergraduate, now he's in grad school in Vermont. And Nathan is at UW La Crosse. Okay. So let's start off by defining what a K term arithmetic progression is in a graph or a KAB. So how we define it in a graph is that we take the distance between your first vertex and your next vertex, uh, so from Z1 to Z2, and then the distance from there to there is V, and the distance between V2 and V3, V4 and V5, up to Vk minus 1, Vk, they all have to be V. So if we look at this bottom graph, then we can take a eight piece, or three, maybe a three eight piece from like the top right, or sorry, top left, to the middle, and then to the right vertex. Or you could go distance two, so you could go from the top left vertex to the far right vertex, back to the bottom left one. And if you repeat a vertex, we call that the generate, but we're not going to want to do that because we'll be looking for a rainbow. All right, so let's define an exact R coloring. So this is where we take the vertex set of our graph and we give them each a color. And if it's an R total color, we can give, and we want to make sure that every color is used at least once. That's why it's exact. So, and then a set is rainbow or a progression, which is what we're mainly going to be looking at if all the vertices in the set are different colors. So if we click the plot again and we did the AP, the three AP from the far right to the center to the upper left or the bottom left, those are both rainbow because we have blue, black, and red there. Any questions so far? Okay. So now this comes, brings us to the anti Vanderwerder number of a graph. So the anti Vanderwerder number, or AW number, as I'll call it is going to be the minimum number of colors you need to force that there is a rainbow KAP. So primarily we're going to be talking about three APs for this talk, but this can be generalized around eight K. And there's some pretty trivial bounds for this. So the first bound is that you need at least K colors or you're not going to get your rainbow KAP. And the upper bound is going to be N uh, Technically, that it's n plus one if you don't have an AP, you call it n plus one. But in most cases, if you color every vertex a different color, you'll get some sort of rainbow AP. It would be unlikely that you don't have any, but maybe if you're doing a, a seven AP and you only have six vertices, then you're not going to get an AP. So, or not a non degenerate. So. Okay, let's have a quick example to go through this. So, what we want to do when we're getting into Vanderwerder number is exhibit a coloring from a lower bound that has no rainbow 3 AP or a KAP. And then we want to show that no matter how we use the next number of colors up, we'll force one. So here is a coloring of P8, the graph on eight vertices, that has no rainbow 3 AP. So if you look at them, you can do like one, two, three, like a crawl left to the next to adjacent to it, and you get red or blue. Or if you go like uh, the first one is the third one, the fifth one. Or you can go backwards, you can go eight, seven, six. But uh, every time that you find an AP on this graph, you'll repeat a color. So hopefully you guys trust me, or you can try it out yourself and convince yourself that this is uh, there's no rainbow 3 AP. Okay, so let's do the upper bound. So let's try to force five colors on this graph. And I'm going to show that when we throw five colors in there, we're going to force that there is a rainbow AP somewhere. So the first thing we want to remember is that by the pigeonhole principle, uh, either the first four vertices or the latter four vertices will have three colors on them because you need five total colors, and you don't want to do like one, two, three, four, all different colors, because, well, I mean, that would also be in this graph. So, right, let's just say that we color the first four with three colors, and the way to do that to avoid rainbow 3 APs is going to be 
repeat that are centric. So that's where blue pink blink from shows. So we have this red, blue, blue, pink. And now we want to color vertex 5. So if we look at vertex 5, what colors can we use? Well, uh, we have 3, 4, and then 5. So we don't want to do uh, 5 being a new color. It either, either has to be the same color as 3 or 4. And then similarly, we also have 1, 3, 5. So we also want to make sure that it's the same color as either 1 or 3. So it's going to be the same color as 3, because that appeared both times. And then we do a similar thing to color 6. So we can do uh, like 2, 4, 6, or I think 4, 5, 6 as well. So we just pick a color, because I think it can be either. But now, but we've only used three colors so far, and we said we were going to use five, so we're in trouble because as soon as we add another color, uh, now we have had the same row at the end. So we have uh, six, seven, eight. I think you have to get like one, four, seven. Yeah. Yeah. So you get some rainbows in there. Okay. So the next thing that we wanted to look at is kind of more general graphs, not just the path. So the first thing we looked at was uh, some conditions on the graph. So one thing we want to look at is a dominating vertex. So a dominating vertex is a vertex that is adjacent to every other vertex in your graph. So if you look, we have the polygon and the uh, black vertex, pink, black, I don't remember. Is adjacent to the other three, so that would be a dominating vertex. And in fact, it's pretty easy to see. If there is a dominating vertex of your graph, your anti valence cream number is going to be three, right? Because if you put three colors on there, uh, the dominating vertex has one color and it's adjacent to the other two colors somewhere. So then you get that rainbow CAP. Okay, so then uh, instead of just uh, dominating vertex, we, we looked at a diameter and radius condition. So uh, the best one we got was on diameter. So if your graph has diameter 2, then your anti band line is 3. So uh, I'm going to show proof of this on the next slide, but I want to show a couple more results that are really good that come from this. So it's a pretty well known theorem in graph theory that almost all graphs have diameter 2. So this leads us to the corollary that almost all graphs have anti-vanimer number three, right? Because if you have vanimer two, then you have anti-vanimer number three, and almost all graphs have vanimer two, so they almost all have anti-vanimer number three. All right, so let's prove the uh, top statement on this slide that the vanimer two implies anti-vanimer number three. Okay. So we want to start out this proof by saying if the radius was 1, then we would have a dominating vertex. So we go back to the 2 previous slides now. And that said, if you have a dominating vertex, your anti vanguard number is 3. So we can go ahead and say, all right, call that case closed. All right, now if the radius is 2, uh, let's say we have two vertices, uh, V and W, that are blue and red. And we can just say, because the graph is connected, it has diameter 2, we know that there's some point where there's two different colored vertices that are adjacent. So let's assume V and W are adjacent. If there's a third vertex U that is green, if it's adjacent to either of these two, you get the rainbow CAB. So you'll either go UVW or uh, UWV. So that is the first case, if they're adjacent to the green one. So if neither of them are adjacent to a green vertex, that means they're both uh, distance two from a green vertex, or all green vertices. So then you can form the AQ with the green vertex in the middle. So we go V, distance two down to the green one, and then distance two back up to W. So then, that will conclude the proof because if you're down to two, you either have a radius one or two. So, all right. 
The next thing we want to look at is hypergraphs. So we kind of wanted to get families of graphs. Um, so there was a result prior to doing this on graph uh, on the integer Lagruen and on Zimaden, and those correlate to the path in the cycle. So we got uh, those families have been solved. So then we, for some reason, I don't remember why, we picked the hot cube. Uh, probably because it has pretty good regular conditions. So uh, I, this is a hypercube. I hope everyone here knows, but I'll just say it quickly. So a hypercube is basically a graph where your vertices are rep represented by zero of one bit strings, and uh, the edges between them, if they differ by exactly one bit. And here's an example of uh, the hypercube on paper, which will come back in there. Another picture. Okay, so our results on the hypercube was that uh, the end of memory number of a hypercube is either three or four, and three when q is, or sorry, not q, n is even, is four when n is odd. And we also found that the extremal coloring for the odd, uh, when it's into memory number four, is unique up to isomorphism. So, because, you know, the hypercube is very regular, so you can switch from uh, colors and it's still the same picture, it's just on different colors. Okay, so here is the end, I guess we saw. Or did I say this? Oh, my bad. The pictures are there. All right. So this is the extremal picture of uh, the coloring. So you have the like one corner is blue. Or sorry, a lot of things are blue. One corner is red, and the other corner is black, and then everything else is blue. And these two are distance three away, the red and the black one. But then uh, there's no other vertices from those, so they're distance three. So we can see that if you, uh, you know, switch those two different corners that were opposite sides of the cube, you get the same picture, just in a different orientation. So, all right. Any questions so far? All right. So let's move on to graph products. So again, I think you guys know what this is, so I'll just go through it briefly. So the product of two graphs, uh, G, square h or cross h alpha and six r even though it's a square and this is just basically you take a copy of a and add each vertex to the first copy of a or vice versa so i actually have a picture on the next slide of an example so uh, the next slide is going to be p2 cross p8 so this is the uh, Path on two vertices across the path on eight vertices, chunk into the third. Um, so actually, just call it the third. And so the next thing I did is I went to Lacrosse and I worked with Nathan the Hunter on finding the grids and the anti memory number of them. And we were able to find that for P2 cross Pn, you get the same type of parity thing as the hypercube. And for P3 cross Pn, it actually switches. So you get instead, uh, when n is odd, you get 3. When n is even, you get 4. And these colorings are unique up to isomorphism as well. So the, they're very similar to the hypercape one, where you kind of take the corners that are opposite and make them distinct. I just found isometric subgraphs. Yeah, I think so. All right, so in isometric subgraphs, this might be a term you guys haven't seen, but maybe you have. An isometric subgraph is a subgraph where all the distances are preserved. So you take your graph, maybe you delete a vertex, that would be an isometric subgraph. But if you take your graph and delete an edge, you are no longer isometric because the Distance between the vertices you delete the edge between is now bigger than one. So uh, we got results. Me, Hunter, and Nathan came up with the idea that, oh, well, if we have a k term resonance regression in a graph and 
the it's like a reversing the mesh progression or a subset of the iso in the isometric subgraph. It's also a progression in that isometric subgraph and vice versa. And that similar idea that if you have an isometric subgraph, the number of pillars you can use on it are bounded by the number, uh, the anti-venomer number of the actual subgraph. So if it's isometric, that, that's true because you say, I think um, you know, my small version of the graph set's isometric. If I color it with too many colors, I'm gonna get a rainbow. And by the one above that, it says, well, if I had a rainbow in the isometric subgraph, that's a rainbow in the orange graph. Okay, so why are these things important? So let's think about this square, and we want to color it. So the anti-venomer number of this square, if anyone know it, because I should know it based on the hypercube we get. <laughs> we know which hypercube it is. It's either three or four, right? Because this is a hypercube. No, that's three. So if we try to shove three colors on here, we're going to force a rainbow. So let's go ahead and just shove three colors on there, however we want. So I did uh, black and rainbow, so counterclockwise, blue, blue, red. And then do red, blue, blue, black. It's irrelevant. So the idea here is now this anti-venomer number was uh, three, because no matter how we shove three colors on that, we're going to end up with a rainbow three at least. But if we delete the edge, now this is the pattern from four vertices, and now there's no more uh, rainbow three AP because I can delete the edge that was helping me do it. So the idea of an isometric subgraph is that it's going to preserve your, uh, or more closely preserve your anti-venomer number, where this is a subgraph that has made the anti-venomer number go up. So it went from three to four, because now I can use these three and get uh, the column that has no rainbow three AB. So this leads us to our result on grids. And our result was that if you have connected graphs G and H, and they have at least two vertices, it doesn't really matter because if they have one, they're just zero H. Um, then you get this bound that the anti-venomer number is at most one. So let's go through the proof sketch because this proof is uh, like a page and a half, I think. <laughs> but we'll do it through the sketch. All right, so first thing we want to note is that if the uh, size of G and H are, or sorry, not size, order of G and H are small, if they're two or less, I guess two, two for either of them, then we get uh, the result. It's pretty easy to see. Uh, we tend to do some case amounts uh, for like bigger than the two by two case, but if you do G, G cross itself uh, or G cross P2, we just get like copy of G adjacent to copy of G, then it's pretty easy to see that it's only uh, three colors or no more than four. It might be four. And then um, that's our first case. So for the rest of the cases, we're going to consider this path. Oh, wait, let's go back. Let's color the G cross H with four colors and assume there's no rainbows in there. And we just want to recall how we're going to think about G cross H as a copy of H with little g as the vertices. All right, so now I want to talk about the path that's going to be P. And what P is, it's the path in some G sub i that's contained in one of the vertices of the big H whose vertices are G sub i. And it has the most colors over all the GI. So if you, I look at each little copy of G on the graph, the most colors I can get on a path are on P. And that length of P is L, just for convenience. Okay. So we're going to break this into cases where we say how many colors are on P. So the first case is that P has three or four colors. So if P has three or four colors, we uh, wanted to think about it as an isometric subgraph by taking G sub i, the 
the season, and the next one over. So G sub i plus one. And what we're going to do with this is make a PQ cross PL. And if L is even, that's what you're going to make you about the ring of gray feet because it'll be at least three colors because P has three colors on a P2 cross P odd if I'm P even. And that will be a rainbow by the previous result. Okay, if L is not even, then it's odd. And then we can actually look at the uh, P3 cross PL. And in some cases, this might actually turn into a G3 cross PL, so like a cycle. But uh, the P3 cross PL, we had that result earlier, but if you have a P3 cross P odd, then you get the integral number three. And the case of C3, you did that as like a lemma. And it was not that hard to show that you also get that's the answer to our number three. So that tells us that we can't have three or four colors in any uh, on any path P. So we go to the next one. That's not what you just said.
so I think it was 2013 or something, or maybe a little bit sooner, but the, so the paper was a master's thesis at, from Iowa State, an Iowa State student named Kelsey, somebody from the U, I think Ulrich, and she uh, like introduced the idea, I think, and then there was a working seminar group at Iowa State, so you year before I got here, so it was like 20, yeah, 2013-ish, maybe 2012, and then they powered through a lot of the um, bracket N and D mod N. So. And then uh, Michael Janar and I were able to complete bracket N in, I think it was 2015, maybe 16. So it's relatively new. And I think we're also working on uh, the K derivative to be like DK plus DN. So then you notice that it still follows the same pattern that you kind of routine with the tip alternating evens odds, or is it something different you've seen before? Uh, it's different so far. So it's a, the, I think the nice thing about three progression, three term AP, is that you know you can kind of think of it instead of like you know doing one, two, three. You kind of think about like look at two and look at the things that are equidistant from two, and if they have you know different colors than three, you kind of get a three AP. But once you get a four, that goes out the window because I can't focus on the center anymore because there's more than one center first floor. So, yeah. uh, so it's a lot harder. Uh, it's been, I've I kind of found a way with diameter to make it easier, I think, but I haven't perfected it. So. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for sitting through that again. No problem. My pleasure. It gets better every time. Does it? Yeah.